Hello, friends. On behalf of the Metropolitan Opera, welcome. My name is Susan Blackwell, and I'll be acting as our moderator today. I am joining you from Muncie, Lenape land, currently known as upstate New York, presented by the Metropolitan Opera as part of our celebration of Women's History Month. We are hosting this series of conversations highlighting the work of world-class creatives who happen to identify as women. This is the first of three discussions which will continue for the next two Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern time, that's New York time. We have so many friends joining us today, educators, supporters of opera and lovers of music. And I wanna give a special shout out to all the members of our Met HD Live in Schools community, especially our students. Hello students. Whether you've attended a Met Opera broadcast of HD Live in Schools many times, or if you rocked the Met Opera Global Summer Camp with us, or if this is the very first time you're joining us for a Met Opera event, we are so happy that you are here and you are in good company. We have folks zooming in from five continents and we wanna say hello to our friends in Zambia and Lithuania and Japan and Peru and Kansas City, Missouri, just to name a few. Welcome everyone. We are so happy to have you here. And today we are speaking to two wonderful artists and distinguished conductors, Dame Jane Glover and Karen Kamensik. Welcome, Karen, and welcome, Dame Jane. Dame Jane, just want to ask again, is it okay if I call you Jane? Absolutely. I haven't quite got used to the Dame bit yet. <laughs> <laughs> and Karen, may I call you Dame? Just kidding, just kidding. Just, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just give it a few years, Karen. Right. Um, <laughs> So I'd like to begin by asking you the question that we have been asking everyone for the past year. Where are you right now? And how are you right now? But for real, and we'll start with Jane, and then we'll hear from Karen. Jane, where are you? And how are you now? But for real? Oh, well, to my astonishment and joy, I am actually in Chicago, uh, where I arrived at the beginning of this week, um, having traveled here for the first time in a year. Um, in fact, uh, this, apart from a couple of trips to Italy, which we may talk about later, uh, in last autumn, I was sort of grounded in London for the whole of the, since almost exactly a year ago, wasn't it, when mm. everything yeah. ground to a halt, and then the horizon receded and receded and everything got cancelled. So um, uh, I'm back in America now for uh, engagements here in Chicago and in Houston and Minneapolis. And I, I'm so excited to be here and I can't wait to get back to work. It's wonderful. And Karen, where are you? When you first came on the webinar, I was like, you look like you're in a grotto. Where are you? I'm in the south of France, um, about a, uh, 90 minutes south of Toulouse and kind of near the historical city of Carcassonne, which all these uh, students should really look up because it's a, it's a medieval, it's a UNESCO um, city that's, that's uh, you know, a, a national treasure and look it up, wow. everybody. It's beautiful for a summer visit when people get to travel again. Exactly. Right. And um, I've been here pretty much the whole time. I was in the north of France when everything shut down. And then we moved into this house during the time and it got renovated. I bought kind of a rundown big country house and panicked, but somehow it got done. The workers wanted to work and now I have chickens and a big garden. So that's what Amazing. I'm doing. Amazing. What an amazing thing to show for a pandemic. Very, very well yeah. done, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> we're all very envious of you. <laughs> so now we're gonna kick it into gear with a little game that we do with all of our guests. <laughs> Please enjoy. It's called 60 Second Life Story. I'm going to put 60, 60 seconds on the clock and you're going to tell us your life stories. Be sure not to leave out the awesome parts. Karen, we're gonna start with you. <laughs> Ooh, you've got 60 okay. seconds starting now. Okay. So when I was four, I started piano. When I was eight, I started the violin. And my teacher at the time discovered that since I could read music in the, when I was taking violin in the schools, I was telling everybody else what to do. So he thought that was a bad thing. And um, he said, here, take a drumstick and beat time. And I thought, what a silly thing, but I loved it. And he thought, wow. you're going to be a conductor someday. And uh, I thought, no, no, no. And in fact, I wound up with 11. I conducted my little mini orchestra, just beat time. 
And then I went to university on piano and I did a lot of accompanying and then I graduated two degrees there in between I was in New York. And early on when I was about 14, I visited New York with my school orchestra and said, the next time we come to the Met, cause we saw a show there, I said, I'm gonna come in through the stage door. And <gasps> I, worked, I worked in Met titles for five years when titles first came out. And then I came to Europe and um, took a long time to get to Europe, but I went to the Volksoper where I was, um, what's called a Kapellmeister, which was a resident conductor. And then step by step, um, my career has grown. And so when I was 30, I said, I want to conduct at the Met before I'm 30. And then I was like, I want to conduct the Met before I'm 40. And it didn't happen. And then I said, if it doesn't happen by the time I'm 50, I'll just give up on the dream. And it happened when I was 49. So I did it. Oh, what a good 60 second life story. That was beautifully done, Karen. That was really, really good. Jane, do you feel up to it? Um, no, no I, I, I'm in awe of that 60 seconds, <laughs> but, but I'll, I'll have a go. All right, here we go, starting now. Um, well, I heard my first Messiah when I was nine years old, and that was a life-changing moment. It was in one of the coldest buildings on the planet, which is Lincoln Cathedral. Um, but I somehow knew when I heard that piece that um, Handel and uh, music were going to be important for me. I was already playing the piano. I then took up the oboe and spent my teenage years really playing the oboe a lot. Um, in youth orchestras and then more grown-up orchestras. I went to university to study music as an academic subject, uh, which it was very much Oxford, um, and did a, a, a PhD on 17th century Venetian opera, which um, had got me into uh, research. I spent four years divided between Venice and Oxford, which is a nice way to spend four years. Um, but the point <laughs> was actually to, to put these operas that I was discovering by a man called Cavalli back on the stage where they belong. And uh, this was also the time when period instruments were coming in. Uh, and so uh, this was early opera with early instruments. And that's really how I started uh, conducting first at Oxford and then I took the big leap to go into the big wide world which was difficult at first um, and I suppose the turning point really was when I went to work at Glyngorn the wonderful opera company in the south of England mm. which was by the way a Mozart specialist company I also mm. was then appointed to the London Mozart Players as a music director it's a wonderful chamber orchestra in London and then my career also grew uh, I'm associated, the, I've, I've mentioned those two composers, Mozart and Handel. Uh, I have a much wider repertory than that. Um, but those two, I think, are, are written on my heart. And um, oh. um, I'll go around, but um, as is Benjamin Britten, that's another story. But uh, uh, that's, I, I'm sure I'm out of time, aren't I? <laughs> You, that, but you nailed it. That was so beautifully done. And thank you for being game. And thank you for playing along. That was, it was wonderful. And it's always so fun to learn so much about people in such a short period of time. I, I want to just ask you a very basic question for my own edification. So traditionally, the term for a conductor is maestro. But and the female form of that word would be maestra. But do each of you have a preference about your title? Do do, do you care? Does it does that mean anything to you? Uh, shall I go, Karen? Uh, yeah. um, technically, maestro is right. Maestra is actually a primary school teacher in Italian. Interestingly, ah. there's been there's been. Um, there's been a, a, a case this week as a not of an Italian conductor who was who was uh, billed as a direttrice, which is conductress, and she really objected to that. She won a competition, I think, um, and so there's been a bit of a hoo ha in the press about that. I, I'm perfectly okay with maestro, and I'm perfectly okay with conductor, and um, I, I've sort of lived with that all my life. I don't know how you feel, Karen. Well, as as a form of address, I mean. In the United States, they tend to like the maestro thing, maestro Kamenzik, maestro. I'm like, I, it's it's a it's a bit foreign to me. In Germany, they just say Frau Kamenzik. In France, they say Madame Kamenzik. Um, I prefer Miss Kamenzik if they're going to. And the, the the stage managers often say, "Well, we have to just announce the function of who is being addressed on the PA system." So maestro to the pit or Meister Kamensik, you know, yeah. instead of just saying Karen, but it's it's quite a, it, I prefer being Karen. I'm a human being and yes. we're yes. all on the same team. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that makes sense. It makes great sense. Thanks. Thank you for, uh, I love, um, 
I just love learning about this world, which I come to much later. And so like many of the students who are watching, I just always love sponging all of this up. So thank you for that. <laughs> so we've got a question from two very young women. They are actually second graders. They're from California. Their names are Josette and Aria. So hello, Josette and hello, Aria. We hope that you're watching. Here is what they wrote. We are sisters who have conducted with sticks in nature since we were little. Did you do the same? Josette and Aria, that is a great question. So Karen, you just mentioned that somebody put a drumstick in your hand. So it sounds like you were, when you were keeping time, you were sort of conducting with a stick from the time you were little. Indeed, I did. And I loved sparklers at the 4th of July. I thought that was just the bee's knees and, you know, the bubble wand. And yes. then I had a baton and um, like the baton that we had in marching band, you know, like the baton twirler, but I always got bonked on the head. So, um, yes, I did. I, I did love to move. I mean, I did take dance, but that wasn't my thing. And I did gymnastics and all of that. So I was always moving with my hands and like many musicians were ambidextrous. We use, we use both of our hands pretty much equally. And um, yes, so I was always doing that. <laughs> always in motion. <laughs> always and, in motion. and Jane, did you conduct with a stick when you were little? And if not, when did you pick up a baton? Um, I, no, I don't think I did. I was much more boring than that. Um, and I love it that, uh, that <laughs> Aria I actually have have picked up sticks to conduct. Um, I started conducting actually when I went to went to university, um, and uh, yeah, I, I was as I as I said I was at a, um, a very very dry academic uh, university then the uh, at Oxford they they didn't really require much performance, but that meant that we did a great deal of performance by ourselves, and put, everybody put on concerts and played and sang for each other, and after a bit. I started conducting and people came and played and sang for me and that's how it worked. But I had been, you know, a singer and, um, and, and an oboist and, uh, and I got in, the, in through that route really. But I'm envious of those girls. You keep, keep be, be, beating time with those sticks and, and feeling the music because that's what it's all about, isn't it? Is, is actually yeah. bringing the music into yourself and, and, and using your body to, to express it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Had when when you um, when you began conducting either with that drumstick or at university, had you seen a woman conduct at that point? Had you ever seen a woman conduct when you picked up a baton? I had, because my teachers, my orchestra teachers, two of them were women, and of um, we we I was lucky enough to be in a system that had a sistema, which is very popular right now. We had that when I was growing up. So there was a gentleman who, by the time I started violin at the age of eight, he had turned 59 and he built up a huge string program in the public schools. We had 2000 string players in this in wow. like three, three counties. And so every well, every week, I think twice a week from the time I was eight until I was about 11, I had orchestra twice a week. And then from the time I was 11 until I graduated high school, I had orchestra every day. And so he built this, he used to be the concert master of the NBC symphony for about five years. And then he moved back to the Louisville area and decided to build this program. And so I, I was lucky enough to, to be in this. And he had two assistants who did sort of the mini orchestra level and down and they were women. And um, one of them, uh, three of them were women actually. And the third one who came along when I was about 14, she was a violinist and she said, we're gonna play the spring, uh, spring concerto, Vivaldi. And she said, I don't wanna conduct from the violin so I'm gonna let you do it. And that was basically my first gig. And how old were you then, Karen? 14. Excellent. Wow. Good teacher. Just That's great. Luck. I, I'm, I'm not sure how it sounded, but it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that there are, are students who are watching this now who are exploring what their professional path might be. And each of you have touched on this, these seminal teachers or these moments at university where, you know, your peers and other people were trying things and it was, it was something to, uh, that you were drawn to try. Could, you, could each of you speak a little bit about the steps that you took to become a professional conductor? Jane, could you talk a little bit about, about what were those critical steps that you took to become a professional? Well, I'm a little bit ashamed to, to say all this, but um, 
because I'm so much older than everybody else, I, I'm actually of the generation that has not actually had a conducting lesson ever. And uh, now there are fabulous programs for conductors um, at conservatories uh, all over the place and, and, and festivals and all that. Really, um, when, when I started, there, there weren't any. And I mean, if you look at m most of the conductors of my generation, of, uh, certainly in the UK, um, uh, sort of went through, as I did really, the university route, which was uh, um, particularly, I have to say, they all came from Cambridge. Uh, you know, there's a great rivalry between Oxford and Cambridge, but uh, um, I'm, I'm flying the flag for Oxford. Yeah, um, uh, yeah I, I started, as I say, because, I, I, you know, I started putting on concerts when I was yeah. at Oxford. And then, because I was passionate about opera and was um, somebody, we, we decided to put on The Marriage of Figaro. <laughs> and I conducted Figaro when I was 21. Um, and in my final year as an undergraduate. And uh, that was an incredible experience. I mean, I, I say now that actually it taught me more. It was totally extracurricular, but it taught me more than anything else I did as an undergraduate in those three mm. years uh, at Oxford. What I learned doing that figure, and I remember it to this day, I've done figure quite a lot since, um, <laughs> But curiously, you know, I mean, there's nothing like, as it were, to use a gardening metaphor, getting your hands dirty That's and right. uh, just getting in there and, and discovering. I mean, and if you can make those massive finales work, then something's going right. Um, and um, my goodness, uh, the, the, the sort of passion for him and, and the product uh, was, 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 I mean, I, God knows what it sounded like. It was probably dreadful. But, um, uh, you know, it, it, we actually did get rather good reviews um, nationally. So, and, and that did encourage me, actually, to, to sort of move on to the next step. And as I said, I've never actually had a lesson. But, of course, I, there are people to whom I have taken pieces and said, can you help me with this or that? And more to the point, when I was at Glyngorn, I went into this opera company I mentioned, um, of course, not as a conductor. I went in as the most junior member of the music staff uh, because I wanted to be um, a small cog in a large wheel and learn mm. my trade, actually. Mm. And uh, therefore, I became... Um, a, a, the, the two... When I was there, I was there for eight years, basically, um, moving up the, the, through, the, through the, the, the jobs, as it were. Um, but the two people who were the big cheeses there were Bernard Heitink and Simon Rattle. Bernard was a little bit older than me, quite a lot older than me, and Simon was a little bit younger than me. <laughs> but uh, it was just wonderful to learn from them. And I assisted Bernard Heiting a great deal, actually, both at Glyndebourne and mm -hmm. at um, Covent Garden. And um, I must say, you know, that, that he's my, my mentor. I think mm. we possibly all have a mentor, and Bernard Heiting is mine. And I worship him to this day. 92 he is, 91. Yes. 92. Amazing. Amazing. Mm, Amazing. Beautiful. I, there, I just want to spotlight two things that you said. You said many wonderful things, but the doing, the actual doing of the thing, the activity, getting your hands dirty and doing, and also the blessing of having a really wonderful mentor. Those are the types of, those, those are the types of things that um, allow for such great growth. Absolutely, because I, I mean, I don't, Karen, I hope you agree that, that actually, of course, you could be taught wonderfully um, and, and of course, being taught repertoire and taken through that sort of stuff, which, which all the, all the, um, the, the uh, courses for conductors now do so, so fantastically. But the two things really are observing other people that you really admire to see what makes work. And I mean, I mean uh, the, the two conductors I mentioned are so different. Bernard Heiting is minimal and Simon, particularly when he was, you know, in his early twenties was just all over the place. But and when I say all over the place, just full of energy as he still is, you know, I mean, it's just, he's so riveting to watch and gets amazing results and just such a formidable man. Um, and so d just to, to sort of observe them as, as was one thing that's, so watching really wonderful people mm. and learning from, and then the other thing, as I say, is just doing it to see yeah. what it feels like to have music going, not just through your head and your heart, but your hands. 
Yeah. It's beautiful. It's and beautiful. seeing what works to, to find your own sort of um, eloquence of gesture. See what yeah. works. Karen, will you speak to this a little bit? What were the steps that you took to becoming a, a professional conductor? Um, so I, I went to Indiana University as a piano major and I didn't want to be a piano major, but it was the only degree that was appropriate at the time. Since, since then, about 10 years ago, they started a degree in collaborative piano, which for anyone who doesn't know what that big word means, it means basically accompanying, playing with other people. The piano can be quite a lonely instrument. Mm. And that would have been more appropriate for me at the time because um, I have one superpower and it's sight reading. And so people got oh. a load of that very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was employed constantly and people would drag me into their lessons because at Indiana University, most of the time the students could not come to the lessons without an accompanist. So huh. um, the, I played for the greatest studios there, also for all of the vocal studios, which for me was a gold mine in, mm. um, in learning all kinds of different styles, all kinds of different languages. And um, I also wound up being quite cheeky also as an undergraduate. And if you could get, you, you had to have a minimum, no maximum of seven instruments you could get together without permission of the faculty. So oh. composers started coming to me to have them, to have me conduct like, you know, a septet or something that was the maximum. And then as you got into master's school, it got a little bit bigger. Um, in between my bachelor's and my master's degree, I had met fortuitously through the brilliant professor Janos Starker, who was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant cello professor. He, he said, a little birdie tells me you want to conduct. And the little birdie was his accompanist who was my piano teacher. And he says, yeah, Karen's gonna be a conductor. She never practices piano. She sight reads her lessons. So can you, can you <laughs> make her work a little harder? So he gave me the hardest things to play. And he says, a little birdie tells me you wanna conduct. And I said, yeah. And he rarely talked to the pianists. And so while I had his attention, I said, I'd really like to go to Germany next summer. Is there anywhere you could recommend that I could assist someone in the opera? Cause I'm from Indiana, like I didn't know anything, you know? <laughs> and um, he said, yes, tell, call Dennis Russell Davies and tell him I sent you. So I was like, those are pretty big words. And I had to go at the time I was like 18. I had to go look in a book to see who Dennis Russell Davies was. And he was the chief conductor of the American Composers Orchestra at the time. And so I did, I wrote him and I said, Janusz said I should contact you. And so the next summer he let me come to the Jeunesse, the Jeunesse Musicale in Weikersheim. And my first opera there was, I think, Figaro. We did it in German. And I was a coach and I conducted the chorus. And we were all kids, you know, between 18 and 25, maybe. Great summer, learned German very quickly. And um, I went there for three summers with him. And the second summer we did um, Philip Glass's Orphée, which mm -hmm. Philip Glass has naturally become someone who's been a total part of my professional life. Yeah. And yeah. the third summer I did Falstaff. And so I conducted those things. And in the meantime, I went back and did a master's at the same time at Indiana University. And I became the um, opera assistant. And I did Nixon in China, Rigoletto and Tales of Hoffman. And those were invaluable experiences. And then I moved to New York and gigged a lot on piano and did some off-Broadway things with Philip Glass and a couple of other places and worked titles at the Met. And then there was a dry spell from the time I was like mm. 28 to 30. No one would hire me. No one, no one wanted me as an assistant. I wasn't getting any auditions. I didn't want to play all the time. And I thought, this is it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to quit. Mm. I didn't mm. want to be an opera coach because I, even though I could sight read, I didn't have the piano chops to keep up with those who really do the job well and um, said, I'm going to quit. But I did a last ditch effort and I wrote to Simone Young and I was like, Jane, you might appreciate this at the time. I mean, being a woman in this profession has always been a topic of discussion, of course. And the subtext for me at that time was, and it was the last time I thought about it was a woman has to help another woman. And so I was like, it took her three years to contact me because she had a baby. And then I got a little postcard while I was at Brevard Music Center in North Carolina assisting. And um, she said, why don't you come assist me in November? And it was like August. And I was like, okay, it took you three years to write me. And so I went 
And I had a lot of experience under my belt at that time. And her manager was, so I literally got off the plane for this gig. And she said, go up there and conduct. She was doing a dress rehearsal of Bruckner seven. And I learned it on the plane, I think. And I conducted in Bergen. And she, as I came back into the audience um, to listen to the rest of her rehearsal, she just whispered to me because she'd only seen a video of me. That's it. And she said, yeah, you've got the chops. And her manager was sitting there. And I marched up to him and I handed him a video on my resume. And I said, I'm assisting Miss Young on two projects. And after that, I'm quitting because my career is going nowhere. And three months later, I got a fax from him saying, I'm going to put you into the pit at the folk supper. He said, you have enough stick technique to not kill the performance. And anything else after that, we can see. And that's exactly what happened. And I moved to Europe like a month later. And that was it. So that was my break. It turned on a dime for me. I've been employed for years. Unemployed for years. Yeah. Karen, you seem to, there's a, a theme that's running through these stories you're telling at critical moments, you're cheeky in just the right way. Like you just, <laughs> <laughs> you just step forward in just the right cheeky sort of way. It's wonderful. It's May great. It continue. May it continue. <laughs> the other thing that I think is worth underscoring is that it doesn't always, you know, there are times in an artist's life when it's not easy or you feel like it's not going to happen. And, um, you know, yours is a beautiful example of if you, if you do keep going, if you keep putting one foot in front of the other, and sometimes even saying, if, if, if this is it, I'm done. I don't know. I'd like to tack onto what, I'd like to tack onto what Jane said, actually, because when, when I was coming through, there were also not so many competitions and, and there Mm. was not this networking that the younger, the younger people have right now. It was very difficult to find work. And um, the United States is so large. And I waited a little bit too long to go to Europe where everything is much more compact. There's a lot more action, but you know, my history is what it is. I can't change it. And I'm happy the way it is now, but at the time I thought it was never going to take off. Mm. But, and look um, at you now. It's wonderful. <laughs> so, yes, when, I mean, I, I, th- I, can I just come in on that? Because please, I certainly, yes. when, um, when, when I started, you know, I had to make the, because uh, I did my doctorate at Oxford and, and clearly my supervisors there had sort of mapped out this academic career for me that I, you know, and actually, you know, I, believing that much as I do love thinking and writing about music, I think it's more important to play music than to write about it. And um, I thought I really, really do want to make make this work somehow. And I took the big decision to leave Oxford and go to London. I had about three jobs lined up at Wexford Opera Festival, the BBC and for a festival in London. I thought, well, this is a start. And for that first year, and I, I did those. And then of course it all sort of dried up and, um, and there were a couple of really tough years. I mean, think a few things came in but barely enough to live on. And, you know, Mm. when you do sort of lie awake at night worrying how to pay the bills, um, that's quite (laughs) educational. And of course, I had to find other ways of paying the bills, which which, which I did. Like, uh, actually, I'll tell you one thing that's really fascinating. I mean, I I did a a little bit of music journalism. I wrote the music column in a magazine called The Listener for a bit. Um, But I also edited music for performance for Neville Mariner of the uh, Academy of Martin mm-hmm. the Fields. And um, uh, I took over from Christopher Hogwood, who, you know, just preparing material for them mm-hmm. and then attending some of their recording sessions. Well, my goodness, what an eye opener that was. You know, if you're going to talk about learning by watching people, there was nobody who was more experienced in a recording studio than Neville Mariner with the Academy mm-hmm. of Martin the Fields. And it was just wonderful to sort of be part of that. And then, as I say, my sort of breakthrough was deciding that I wanted to go to Glyndebourne uh, and be part of this bigger, bigger um, wheel. And I went as a pianist, which I am not, Karen. I'm so <laughs> envious of your ability to, to sight read. I'm a hopeless sight reader, which meant that I have to. I really had to practice everything that I knew practice. I was working on. And there was there was no way they were going to put me on Rosen Cavalier. <laughs> so, you know. Any of those tricky sorts. And I must say that after a year of being at sort of the lowest of the low and the music staff, they made me 
chorus director, which suited me very well, because uh, mm. I've always loved choirs and, and voices of all sciences. Um, and, and that went hand in hand with being music director of the touring company and so on. Mm. That's how I advanced to that. But I mean, I have pianistic skills, uh, very basic, and but I always play my own recits in opera, mm. uh, which I love to do, love to do that. Um, but I still can't play Rose and Cavalier. Are, are, you, are, you are you playing the recits in Albert Herring? I'm not actually. Um, those, I think, I, I've never done that. They're tricky um, to get uh, in and out of. It's almost like. <laughs> abso absolutely. Uh, um, but it's no trickier than doing the whole of the War Requiem, doing the Chamber That's, Orchestra. Oh, yes. Yeah. As the, the, the big orchestra, which is just, but I would hate to give that any, any of that away. It's just, I think, with the with the recits in, um, I just never have, and so I'm not going to. Um, also, no, it's nice for somebody else to do it. Yes. How clever of you to know I'm doing that, though. Well, there's a story <laughs> behind that, but I'll tell you privately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I'm so glad that you jumped in and shared that, Jane, uh, just because I think it would be very, very easy and reductive to look at what both of you have accomplished. You are conducting at the highest levels globally to look at that and say, oh, it, it, they must have been born that way. It must have come easily to them. But really it's, you know, it's a real journey and it has, there are times when it does feel like two steps backwards. And there are times when yeah. you do lay in bed at night and think, do I want to quit? How am I going to pay the electric bill? But uh, so I think it's, I think it's worth pointing that out because it's very easy to just think that this was your destiny, but really you worked very hard and, at it. And interestingly, that, that time of, of, you know, what lying awake, wondering how to pay the bills, uh, you know, that stood one in good stead when a world pandemic hit, you know, when suddenly everything yes. dried up. And, yes. Uh, yes. You know, well, I've lived through this before. And in fact, of course, I, I, I very much know I'm one of the lucky ones. I, you know, I have a lovely home in London and I'm, I'm sort of fine. But I didn't have any income for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so you sort of just fall back on needing very little. And um, I'm sure that was honed in those years at the beginning when one had it. <laughs> it was yeah. very familiar somehow. It's like, I've, I've... <laughs> Return to the lean years. Yeah. Uh, so one, uh, when one picture, pictures a conductor, um, we might picture something like these photos that we're going to share. We're going to share some photos of Jane conducting first. We've seen conductors in opera. We've seen images of conductors in not just culture, but pop culture. We've seen Bugs Bunny conducting cartoons. <laughs> Jane, we know what this looks like from the outside, but I'm curious, what does this work, this craft, this years of study, the actual physical activity and the responsibility that comes along with this, can you tell us a little bit about what it feels like from the inside to be doing this? Uh, well, it's, it's from the inside, it's, it's your, your first um, loyalty, your first duty is to the composer and to the music. And mm. uh, the first thing you absolutely have to do is know your scores inside out. And um, believe me, if you don't, uh, it will show. If, if not, if you can get away, might get away with it. You've seen, one has seen this happen also with other people. The, the audiences notice, and so do musicians particularly. They always know. Um, and, but if you absolutely know your scores and know your music and what you want to say about it, and, and you actually inhabit it, um, then it is, it is a, the business of actually communicating that belief, that um, identity with the people you are working with and um, bringing them on to your, to your, to your wavelength. So I'm not being very, I'm sure Karen will put this much more articulately than I. You're doing pretty well. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so it's therefore, uh, much of it is about communication. Mm. Um, and interestingly, I'm, I'm about to, to, to return to work and I'm, I've been told I must wear a mask to rehearse and and uh, indeed perform. And uh, Karen, I don't know whether you had to do this. I, I'm sort of a little worried about this because although one of course doesn't say anything, one's face is actually quite expressive. And to have half of it missing 
I think like, it's going to be quite a quite a challenge for me. I, I think with this, but I'm interested to know what Karen thinks about that. But um, uh, yeah, just th this communication uh, with, and as I said earlier about finding a, a, an articulacy and eloquence of gesture, which may be big or maybe small, but it's, it's so much about. Um, communication, A, with the people you are working with, and then, of course, the people to whom you are performing. Uh, one thing I, I'm, I know we've all missed in the last year is not just the joy of making music with other musicians, but actually that essential thing for any performer in any field of dialogue between performer and audience. Mm. And uh, mm. I, um, that is, we never should underestimate the, the impact uh, and the contribution that an audience makes to live performance of any kind. And they are as much part of the equation as, in a sense, the, the performers too. Mm -hmm. if that Absolutely. Makes sense. Absolutely. And I just want to offer this to you, Jane. I, I obviously I'm not a conductor, but I do. Um, I have filmed some film and television during this time and have wore this thing that sort of rests on my collarbone and put a shield up between my face and the rest of the world. And I just think, wouldn't that be better than having the lower half of your face concealed to be able for, for your, the people that you're working with to be able to see your whole face, even it's, if it is um, through a clear shield. I don't know, maybe oh. an option. I'll, I'll look into that. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Karen, I want to, I want to um, show some photos of you conducting and would love to hear your response to what Jane just surfaced about having potentially part of your face concealed for this. But can you tell us uh, what this, what this feels like for you from the inside? Um, first of all, to the mask issue in my four concerts in October, November, I did not have to wear one mm. um, on my podium. That was my little space. People were far enough away from me that um, that it was not a problem. But coming and going anytime off the podium, we had to wear masks and some musicians played with them. Some do not. Mm -hmm. And I think every single um, venue, every single institution has different rules and they are to be adhered to. Um, yeah. It doesn't bother me so much in principle. I think I'm a bit of a survivor in that way that I'm like, well, you know, it's either this or nothing, so I'll make do. Um, mm. And I think most of us are that way. I think, Jane, a little advice from the younger colleague. I don't, I think the minute your hand goes up and you're in that space, it's, you're just going to forget it's there. And, and, you know, you're such a performing animal and a consummate musician that that your eyes will tell them everything and your beautiful hands will tell them everything and you'll forget you have it on, I think. Thank you. <laughs> I think. Um, being on the inside, this, uh, yeah, this is at the Met, um, <laughs> clearly. I'll tell the little story of my first orchestra rehearsal at the Met, which was not without a little bit of pressure. Um, Firstly, because I had been in super titles at the Met. So all the technicians who knew me from those five years where I, yes. you know, I had the, I had the TV screen of any, any conductor that came through the house. It was like paid learning time. Um, I observed all of them. What I didn't know that, it, I don't know, Jane, if this happened to you, but it certainly happened to me that it's a little bit of a tradition that people come check out the new conductor at the first orchestra rehearsal. And it felt like my jury for my, you know, my graduate uh, recital suddenly. <laughs> and I come in, you know, and I'm like, okay, the first two minutes of any orchestra rehearsal with a new orchestra are, are the telling sign if you're going to sink or swim. And knock on wood, I've always swum. But um, I walked in and I was like, you know, Philip Glass is is tough. It's not everybody's favorite repertoire. Um, it's one of the things that I do most. Um, and I feel comfortable with the repertoire. And uh, so I put up my hands and I'm thinking, hmm, how do I, how do I win them over? The whole piece is in A minor and, and F, <laughs> F major, A minor, and a little bit of C major. How am I going to win them over? And they had played other Philip Glass pieces. So they were kind of sitting there and I, I, said what I needed to say and in come like a hundred other people like um, Peter Gelb, Diane Zola, all of the coaches, my coaches, anybody who wasn't rehearsing at the time. And I was like, oh, it's like a performance. And I said, all right, this is another one of those moments, you know? And mm. then I put my hands up and I just said, I'm just going to let them play. I'm going to let them play. And after about two minutes, I had to stop because 
they weren't together. And I had to teach them differently to any other repertoire that we play what two beats against three means actually without taking anything off the end of the measure to phrase. And so we had a little lesson in rhythm and um, then it was fine. I never had to say it again. And they understood what my concept was. So that was, that was probably, might've been that moment right there, who knows. But um, yeah, brings back memories. And then, and then it was wow. fine. On the inside, oh, I love that picture. And I just so people picture. can see, if you look to the very right of the photo, you're going to see Karen and Karen's yeah. baton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how does it feel? I don't know. It's, it's difficult to describe when it's your happy place. You know, it's not the mm. happy place for everyone. And some people, I, I guess I get nervous, but I think my whole existence is a little bit nervous. I mean, we're working with people and it's, it's not without good reason that a lot of, um, CEOs of big businesses ask their managers to come observe orchestra rehearsals because mm. nowhere except maybe in, in an operating room in a surgery, um, it, do people work so intensely together for such a, a mm. intense period of time? Like without a break, you work 90 minutes without a break. You know, Amazing. in most yeah. offices, they're like 20 minutes of work and then a little coffee break and I'll get on the phone, I'll play Candy Crush for a while. There's none of that in orchestra rehearsal, <laughs> you know? So how do you keep people's attention? And, you know, every single one of them is a consummate artist of their own. And I always say it's, we're lucky if everybody's rowing the boat in the same direction. And I feel not only, as Jane said, that I am ambassador, an ambassador for um, the composer, but I'm also an ambassador for these incredible artists who um, have something to give individually. Certainly the person standing up front should have a concept, but one of my um, mantras, I guess, is, is like the Hippocratic Oath for music. First of all, do no harm. Like, <laughs> listen to what they give you before you start thinking that you know better. Um, and eventually, we, we, I hope I always find a middle ground. But I, the, hard, the hardest moment for me in a space like this, for example, in the first time or during the HD um, broadcast, when you know that like hundreds yes. of thousands of people are watching and, yes. and I'm like, Karen, don't trip, don't trip, don't trip. The hardest, the hardest moment is actually taking that first step when the person standing next to you says, Karen, go. And then I walk into the pit and then you kind of focus mm. and you bring your A game. But, you know, the, the benefit of, of um, conducting, especially, I think, especially opera, symphonic music is a bit different especially opera is that you have a long rehearsal period. And so you have a lot of time to kind of get your kinks work out of you. And for an education like I had, where I came up as an opera coach, um, you know, it was a step-by-step -step approach of building skills and learning them so that I learned from those before me and could just kind of step into the role. And, but I do have to tell myself still, you know, Karen, you're not faking it. You're really doing it. Um, you know, I still, we get nervous. Jane, oh, yeah. to speak to that, do you still get nervous when you conduct? Oh, gosh, yes, absolutely. And uh, I, I think um, that, uh, that nervousness is, is a very sort of familiar despair. I think it is part of, the, mm. um, part of the process, actually. I think I would be worried if I didn't get nervous to get that. <laughs> fact, I'm, I'm rather missing it, actually. <laughs> that sort of, uh, I mean, I'm getting it now because I'm approaching, you know, yes. return to work. But uh, um, and and it, it is it yes it is part of the process I think um, but as Karen says once you start you're away I mean you it, 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 you know your knees don't feel yeah. as if they're going to come on to you and you don't think you're going to throw up any anymore or pass out or, and Jane, <laughs> and, I, in worst cases in worst cases that that is what it's like. And, and I would agree with you, my first rehearsal at the Met was one of those occasions, you know, walking to work that morning. Is this stress? Yes. <laughs> um, but in fact, it was lovely. I mean, it was, you know, I think was, everybody was so nice and um, I had a, such a good time. Yeah, um, what was I gonna say? I was gonna say, no, every time, like what you said, you forget about it, you know, and, and I get so nervous sometimes, but my nerves go over weeks. They're not like just concentrate on that mm. moment. And then when it's done, like when I start and the performance is over, I'm like, 
why do I get nervous? I know. Why? You know, I'll do better next time. I won't get nervous yes. next time. I won't torture myself. And then the time. cycle, the cycle begins again. <laughs> right. It's um, interesting, I, just, but, I mean, yeah, I, you know, Benjamin Britten, who is a composer, I do have a, a lot of t- time for and with and association with. Um, and he, would, uh, as a performer, I mean, was always so nervous. He did throw up before every performance. Wow. He literally threw up. Um, and, and a man of his stature, you know, with, with so many gifts. I mean, he just that, that, whether it was essential for him to do this, I don't know, but he did every time. Wow. It really, the body is preparing to do something extraordinary. And Karen, I've never heard it put the way that you just put it, that it is sort of like being a surgeon or it, it's a prolonged period of extreme focus. And a lot of people mm-hmm. literally having to work in concert with each other. And uh, that is an extraordinary thing to to step up towards. I just want to return to the photo that, Dan, could you just share the last photo of Karen at that curtain call. I just wanted to, I just, this photo uh, capturing this moment, Karen, can you just speak on this just just a little bit? So I got a heap of of flowers that got (laughs) hoisted at me. And I found out later that the titles team bought them for me because I worked there and they just all rushed to the front and chucked them at me. So it was very (laughs) surprising. This was the premiere and just hoops and hollers. Um, And there's, there's another photo that friends of mine captured from that where my, you know, it's hard to photograph a conductor where we don't look terrible like tennis players do, but with my (laughs) arms just open and it just came naturally to me. So this was just a a moment probably of, of reflection. And you can see the happiness of the people behind me, which is really nice, except for Anthony, who's talking to Janae, like they're planning, <laughs> planning their <He's>... pizza party. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I adore that photo. And I just wanted to, to spotlight it. So we have two great questions from two young women in Portugal. The first question is from Ellie, who is in first grade. Hello, Ellie. Hi, Ellie. The question for each of you is how many operas have you conducted? That's a great question, Ali. Jane, do you have any idea how many operas you have conducted? Oh, my goodness. Um, I, I oh, goodness. Uh, Karen, do you know off the top of your head what I do a quick count? I, I, I think think I don't your, yours your is going to be much higher than mine. I think I'm at 67. That's I, I would I wouldn't think I'd done more than that, but something something like that, yes. Um, gosh, <laughs> it's a good Ali. You almost stumped the van. That was a good <laughs> question. But, but the interesting thing is that um, that you know uh, what we do, unlike actors, for instance, um, who will play King Lear once or play Hamlet once. Yes, yes. We do our, our repertory again. And so, for instance, um, uh, well, for a piece like Handel's Messiah, for instance, I've actually done over 100 performances of that. Wow. Um, and uh, Figaro, Figaro, that first opera I ever conducted, I've probably conducted 25 productions of that. Um, I must count them up at some point, you know, because it just these things recur in one's life. Um, but it's always wonderful to add new stuff to to. To, to to one's repertoire and I, um, but uh, every time I do figure out for instance or even Messiah I, you know you learn something new every every time about it uh, it's it's not just sort of oh this we know how this goes and we fax it in we we <laughs> we learn we learn new things from the people we're working with from it, it's 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 like reading Shakespeare you know you you sometimes notice something you've never seen before an image or a simile or something or or walking through um, um venice in you which is a city i know very well but you suddenly see a medallion on a wall you've never seen before and it's it's the same with a very familiar piece of music you think oh my god i've never noticed that and uh, so you learn the whole time and it's these and these great composers constantly challenge you and constantly um um make you step up mm. That's great. The next question is from Lucia, who is in fourth grade and happens to be Ellie's big sister. Hi, Lucia. 
The question is for each of you, Alicia. what is your favorite opera to conduct? This, these are great questions, ladies. And if you decide not to become conductors, you can become interviewers. These are very good questions. So um, Karen, what is your favorite opera to conduct? That's a big question. The truth, but it's not what she wants to know. The truth is the one that's in front of me at the moment. That's a great answer. Yeah. Absolutely. However, I, I do have a couple of favorites. Like I really like Verdi's Otello. I really like Verdi's Falstaff. I really love the Mozart operas, any of them. But in fact, I, I really love the one that's in front of me. Yeah. I, you, I would absolutely agree with that. People are always saying to me, you know, which, what is your favorite opera? Even looking at the Mozart operas, and it is the one I'm about to do, it's, uh, um, the one I am doing. Um, so at the moment, I would say my favorite opera is Albert Herring, because it's on, it's on, the, on the desk in front of me, and I'm doing it very soon. Um, but I suppose if you had to push me uh, on that, uh, I would give you a couple of favorites of the Mozarts. My God, they're all so amazing. But I think Così Fan Tutte is the one that just moves me more as a music, as a complete musical experience is just phenomenal. And that miraculous libretto um, by Da Ponte is just where every word is golden. And the partnership between him and, and Mozart was just so fantastic. Um, and um, otherwise, I would absolutely um, put any of the Britain operas in there as well. Um, and of course, I mean, don't get me started on Handel. So uh, because <laughs> that, that's very much for a lot of people. But, but for me, I mean, it's just, you know, Giulio Cesare, for instance, four and a half hours of it. Heaven. Absolutely mm. heaven. But just so that I can... I can make my um, um, credentials of having a wider repertory than these two composers. Um, I would say something that I hope Karen would be impressed with, because I know you have, <laughs> you're so great with contemporary music. But one of the best, one of the, my favourite experiences in the last few years was when I was director of opera at the Royal Academy of Music and Peter Maxwell Davis. We we huh? commissioned his opera called Camilla Tone, huh? uh, which we shared with Juilliard actually, and. Uh, so I got to do this premiere of, of Peter Maxwell Davis's Camilla Turner with the composer and indeed the librettist, uh, David Pantney, who directed it. Um, and having them in the room all the time through the rehearsal period was like having Mozart and Da Ponte in the room, and it was thrilling. And to create uh, a new piece by a major composer like Peter Maxwell Davis was just, for me, Absolutely. one of the greatest thrills of my career, I must say. Absolutely. Live, working with living composers is one of my passions. Yeah. And, and the dead ones too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, just one last question before we wrap up. And this is a question for you, not just as musicians or conductors or even women, but as human beings, if you could go back in time armed with the knowledge and the experience that you now have, what would you tell your younger self? Jane, oh. you go first. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, we just see who had a thought. Jane, do you have a thought about that? What would you tell your younger self? Well, I, I mean, I suppose I would say to myself, hang in, hang in there, you know, um, A. Uh, B, if you're going to work in opera, make sure that your languages are good. That is um, mm -hmm. essential. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, there is no better way, as Karen said, she, she learned German by, in three minutes by working there. And, and mm -hmm. you know, the younger you are to absorb a language, the better it is. I mean, I've, I've only once done an opera in a language I don't speak or even read. And that was what I did on Yegin in Russian. And I've never worked so hard in my life. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, you have to just immerse yourself in languages as, and, and um, you know, I, I wish I'd got going earlier on the German. I mean, I'm OK now, but, you know, and French and Italian, fine. But you need those three languages. And I, I always tell young conductors that. But basically, to my younger self, hang in there. <laughs> mm, that's lovely. Karen, any good um, words for your younger self? Yes, um, stop trying to please everyone. Uh, can you stop say more about that? <laughs> well, Those are good words. There was, I didn't do it for a long time. And then when things got frustrated, 
frustrating for me. I was like, what can I do to please people so that I will get hired? Mm. And this pandemic has taught me that, okay, I'm in a stable part of my career now, clearly. Um, and I have a great manager who I think is, is going to help me out for the future, even though this year has been on ice and um, to, to trust also that things are going to work out in the end. And I, I didn't. And that's why I wanted to quit. Of course, I couldn't support myself. So I was like, if it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. And I, I got frustrated during those times. Um, yeah. And so I think that's mostly it. And I always tell young people who are, who are frustrated now, and I've discovered this through time. Um, I tell them there is a place for each of us in music. And, and uh, I have a dear singer friend who, who planned her career for herself and it's gone quite a bit differently than she planned for it to go. And she was living this disappointment the whole time. And now she's given up on that. And I encourage people just to say, work outside from your little circle. Don't try to like, if you're here, don't try to go all the way across the globe to find that one thing you want. Start here and build outwards. And that is also more possible now. Mm -hmm. But um, I've, during the pandemic, I've learned that there are certain things I don't miss about the profession. And I'm going to try to be braver about not caring so much. Like Fantastic. if I wear the same thing to rehearsal three weeks in a row, I just don't care anymore. Great. We've been wearing the same thing for a year. Um, you know, <laughs> and, and think all these superficial things that people make to be so important going to the after parties, which I never yeah. like I go, but you know, and all of these extemporaneous things, there are things, the education things are very important, but all the socializing that comes with it was never my thing. And I always felt uncomfortable. And um, so I would say to my younger self, be true to yourself and don't be afraid of the consequences of that. Because if you're not in your natural self, you're just going to make mistakes anyway. So it's great. It is great. Looking to the future. I know we've been living in this pandemic time, but vaccinations willing. Uh, Jane, you are scheduled to conduct Mozart's and then the Magic Flute at the Met in December of 2021. Is that correct? It is. Yes. Yes. Bring on the vaccines, everyone. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And Karen, you are scheduled to return to the Met in the spring of 2022 to once again conduct Philip Glass's Akhenaten. Both of these productions have been favorites of audiences, including student audiences. And um, so I know that we are all very, very excited for everybody's safe and healthy return to the Met. On the behalf of the Met education team, I just want to thank both of you, Dame Jane Glover and Karen Kamensik. You are both wonderful musicians and human beings and women and inspiration. So thank you so much for this conversation. Uh, my face hurts from smiling. I really appreciate <laughs> my it. My pleasure. Thank you for having us. It's been it a It is a pleasure. joy. It is a joy. And we want to thank all of you who are watching for being here with us. We hope you'll join us next Friday, March 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. That's 1 p.m. New York time. And we're going to be having a conversation with the composer, Missy Mazzoli. Missy is Ooh. one of the most, That's yes. Hey. Join us, join us, friends. <laughs> Missy is one of one of the most in demand and busiest composers in the world of classical music, and we are going to have a wonderful hour with her talking about her thrilling career. If you haven't already registered, you can do so at metopera.org/education. And listen to me, and I'm especially talking to you, students. If anyone has a question for Missy, you know I love your wonderful questions, and you can send them to hdschools at metopera.org. hdschools at metopera.org. Thank you again to our wonderful, esteemed guests. Until next week, everyone stay safe and well, and we'll see you then. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.